Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the last session of the day. We'll try and keep this lively and entertaining to keep your neurons firing. Uh, I'm Zach Lynch. I'm the general partner at Jazz Venture Partners. We invest in companies that unlock human potential. Um, and we, are, we have a fabulous panel this afternoon uh, who are going to share with us their insights in how to leverage neuroscience to accelerate learning, um, improve the human condition, and bend the arc, as we like to say at this conference. So without further ado, I'm going to have them give very short introductions of themselves, and then we'll dive right on in. Sure. Um, my name is Hui, uh, co-founder and chief scientist of a company called Likes. So L represents life for learning, and we are mission to uh, use AI technology to uh, empower everyone to achieve their full potential such that everyone could have a better life or have a better learning experience. Wonderful. I'm Melina Unkafer. I don't think I'm on. Can you You're hear me? On. You're on. Okay, great. Um, Melina Unkafer, I'm an educational neuroscientist. I study brains. I study how brains learn and have been doing so for about 20 years. And in the last five years, I've had the great opportunity to uh, figure out how to study brains, not in a brain scanner, but in the real world, in the wild. <laughs> and so I have been using that to really think through what might be the future of R&D for education and how might we bring a really deep and rich understanding of how people learn into how people teach. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Glenn Whitman. I direct the Center for Transformative Teaching and Learning at St. Andrew's Episcopal School, which is just outside Washington, D.C. Uh, we're the only mind, brain, and education science research center based in a pre-collegiate school in the United States currently that has a, an international public purpose. And we've just built and launched uh, what we think is a solution to bring educational neuroscience to all teachers, uh, something we're calling NeuroTeach Global. Uh, my name is Louis Gagnon. I am the CEO of a company called Total Brain. Uh, we have the largest standardized neuroscientific database in the world. We have an assessment to, to assess a total brain with tasks uh, on an app that can uh, be done in 20 minutes. And we, uh, based on the result of that assessment, suggest um, brain capacity training uh, that spans um, digital training, and mindfulness breathing meditation uh, for people to change their brain capacities and uh, optimize themselves. Thank you, Luis. That was great. Um, so why don't we just dive on in here to set the baseline and talk about what is the state of play with neuroscience as it relates to learning? Melina, you're the educational specialist. Why don't you kick it off? What is the state of play? Let's see, I have a, a year-long course, <laughs> so let's, let's put it in one sentence. Uh, no, right now, you know, we have 120 years of learning science that have not been brought to bear on how we teach. And only recently has neuroscience really been, um, been contributing to that. But the, the broader kind of conversation is actually around the cognitive science of how people learn, the social science of how people learn, the affective science of how people learn. And all of that is grounded in the brain, yes, but what we really need to understand is kind of the, the expression of that learning. And so we are actually pretty far along in understanding how people learn. We're just scratching the surface and understanding how the brain um, learns in real world environments, but there are all sorts of ways that we can use the neuroscience of learning to help us understand uh, how to ground our teaching in a really deep understanding of the brain. And you know, there there are people that say that you know the bridge between neuroscience and education is a bridge too far, and I completely agree. Actually, I think there's um, there's a lot that we're learning about neuroscience that doesn't have anything to do with education, but the parts that are kind of the larger um, frameworks of how people learn, like learning is, learning occurs in three major stages. We first experience the event, we then have to uh, store that event, and then we have to express it later. So these three stages of learning, encoding, storage, and retrieval, mean that that gives us a, a beautiful framework for how we think about learning and how we leverage each of those three stages of learning. How do we leverage practices that allow us to uh, to learn things in a deeper way, to lay down deeper, stronger memories. And then in the second stage, how do we use practices that allow us to store those memories more deeply? And then in the third stage, how do we use practices that allow us to retrieve the right information at the right time? 
And so that type of framework of the neuroscience of learning, I think, is really helpful. Getting into the neurotransmitters, and sorry, I know you teach neurotransmitters. <laughs> um, getting into that level of detail may not be as helpful, um, but really thinking about the, the large kind of framework of, of learning, of how the brain learns, um, and thinking about how we connect that with education and how we connect that with teaching is, I think, really exciting. Terrific. So from the high level to, to Glenn, yep. where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, no, I, I, I can speak as a daily classroom teacher. I actually taught my class this morning in Washington, D.C., virtually, uh, from San Diego. And, uh, you know, I've been teaching 28 years, and I, there's no doubt about that I'm an exponentially better teacher today than I was 28 years ago. And you might say, okay, that's obvious. You should be, right? I mean, if you're not, <laughs> get out, I guess. Uh, but I would actually say I'm better than I was five years ago. And it's really in that time that both me and my colleagues at a school that decided we're going to train 100% of the teachers in educational neuroscience really began to have this lens into thinking about the only educational truth I think I know is that every kid will have their brain in every one of my classes, <laughs> right? I mean, we're not going to counter that. So shouldn't I know more about it? Um, and I will say from the work of our center, we, in the research we've done with about 9,000 teachers, Roughly only about 20% of teachers in a self-reported survey, so we know some are lying, or probably, um, say they have any foundational knowledge in the science of learning. That could be reading a book or going to a conference. So there is this great irony of how to get this body of research to, into the heads, and I would actually say to the hearts of teachers and school leaders around the world, and certainly we're trying to solve that solution from the teacher perspective. And so, Luis, you're, you're out there in the world trying to help people better understand their capabilities. How do you see the state of play as, as it relates to neuroscience and learning? The way I see it um, is people invest tremendous amount of resources in learning soft skills and learning hard skills, and nobody cares about the operating system. And so what uh, I would like to suggest is that we spend a little more time in taking care of that brain so that we put ourselves in conditions where we can better learn and better perform in all sorts of ways. And that's really been uh, the angle that we took at our company. Mm -hmm. And Hue, your, your company now has 100 million users uh, in China using your educational learning platform and you guys are trying to leverage neuroscience to understand <laughs> how things are, you could sort of take that next level step. Um, what do you see that's been talked about in educational neuroscience uh, that looks applicable to your problem set that you're trying to solve? Yeah, sure. So I think there are basically, I think many two ways that neuroscience can affect learning. Um, broadly speaking, in my perspective, there are two types of learnings. One is what we talk about uh, human, human learning, humans learning. But I come from the field of computer science or say artificial intelligence. I'm working hard on teach how machine learns. So in my, in my perspective, there are two types of learnings. One is human learning, the other is machine learning. So for the neuroscience, recently we've seen the neuroscience uh, inspirations or insights actually help the development of machine learnings. A lot of uh, algorithm and art architecture design in machine learning or the so-called deep learning are inspired by some of the theories from neuroscience. So I found that fascinating to leverage uh, ideas and insights from neuroscience field to the machine learning field. And the other type of learning what we care most is the human learning. And I do see in this field as well, that neuroscience can actually benefit the human learning. For instance, uh, we can find some existing theories in the neuroscience, try to apply it into the curriculum design, to apply it into what we did right now. What we are doing right now is we build an AI teacher for learning. Could we leverage some of the principles that we discovered in how human brain learns into the design of the AI teacher and such that the AI teacher could be more efficient, could follow the general principles that are effective when we using the teach, AI teachers to teach human learning. So I think, although uh, I agree with uh, the other panelists as well, that uh, I think it's uh, still in the early stage of how we understand actually brain 
experience. But uh, there are already some ingredients and some findings that we can leverage to, to, to apply it into the, the real world applications. What we are doing right now is that we have a team of neuroscientists trying to uh, do uh, large scale behavioral experiments, not just from small sample size, but from a very large sample size. We have a platform of over, as you mentioned, uh, 100 million registered users. That's a very good test bed that we can verify some of the previously clinical, <laughs> clinical <laughs> results and then on, on, a, on, a, on a relatively large scale. Uh, data sets and large scale participants. I think that's uh, very exciting areas that we are looking forward to. Great, so that's a little bit on the, the state of play and I'm sure we could have a whole panel on just that question, um, if not a course. <laughs> um, what do you guys think about peak performance? Um, what does peak brain performance mean to each one of you? Because I know you come from it at, from different perspectives and maybe we can start with you, Luis. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we think of peak performance in two ways. One is relative to myself. Am I operating at my full capacity? And the other is relative to the rest of the population. Am I in the top 5% of the people in this group that performs and kills it for any organization? And so uh, on the first bucket, 76% um, of the US population uh, is having some sort of risk of being emotionally uh, in suboptimal positions, which affects the way that they perform in daily life, pretty much at anything. Uh, so they are not at their perfect uh, condition. They cannot perform at best. Only 19% based on our database are in such condition where they're not at risk of anything and they are uh, functioning at, at optimal capacity. Uh, that is a big deal. Now, that can change by training and by taking care of ourselves. And neuroplasticity and all of this is, is old news by now. But if you give people a chance um, to become aware and do things that are good for their brain, and if they do it, we have evidence that it can move the needle fairly quickly. Uh, we're dealing with Fortune 500 companies here in the U.S. We have 23 of big ones right now. And, I, and in average, when people uh, become aware that they're suboptimal and do uh, custom training based on their own brain profile, work on the capacities they have to work on, um, they end up moving their brain capacities significantly, improving productivity by an average of 7%. Uh, with results like that, a very small company like ours were Boeing Vendor of the Year a couple of years ago. Uh, don't have to tell you how many uh, vendors Boeing have. It's quite an achievement uh, just on, based on the simple fact that when you want to do something and if you do the right thing, you can really improve your peak, your capacity to be the best self. Now, uh, in terms of the uh, general population, about 5% of our database would be considered at peak. Um, in terms of being exceptionally uh, capable. Uh, and what we find when you profile those people is that they have exceptional openness, positivity, uh, great cognitive flexibility, high resilience, um, and also uh, their inveigle tone. Their hard variability uh, is, uh, is higher than the average, uh, which means that uh, they're not in fight or flight. They are in expansive mode where they want to connect and communicate, and that's a high performer uh, from a database standpoint uh, in our database. Excellent, excellent. Glenn? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think this is the opportunity to leverage educational neuroscience uh, in schools. So the way we think about peak performance for students from preschool through 12th grade, that's sort of our our sweet spot in many ways, is how can you create environments that are both academically challenging, but the kid is happy and, and, and joyful, right? That's the sweet spot, that peak performance, we would love students to live in every day. And I, I, this is where I see the opportunity with uh, the field of educational neuroscience. It's called a lot of different things in our world, mind-brain education. Um, you know, if you can teach teachers and elevate a teacher's understanding of just around memory, we know we can help kids uh, make things stick better. But at the same time, 
how do you make the kid who comes to a school with anxiety levels that are amazing, uh, uh, scary ma amazing in this country, the stress levels they have, feel safe, feel validated, feel like they belong? Because if you don't do that, there's no way you're going to get the cognitive peak performance. So I would say the opportunity with educational neuroscience um, for teachers and schools is leveraging it to find that sweet spot between challenge and happiness or well-being. Then we can get the best out of every kid every day, prepare them for these worlds that they're going to inherit and uh, hopefully take great care of me and everybody in the room. <laughs> um, and the, the only thing I'll ask is just think about your own educational experience. And I would ask you, how happy were you? I mean, we, most of us were in rigorous schools, challenge schools, too much homework, we were surviving, right? We know that does not create peak performance, whether it's in school or work or, or in life. Yeah. So let me, those are great. Let me build off of those. Um, to be in peak performance, we need to understand kind of the core foundations of performance. Um, and the thing that we know for sure is that all of our ability to to learn, to you know, succeed, it all is supported by our, a set of capacities that we call executive function. So how do we manage our attention? How do we manage our thoughts? How do we manage our emotions and our behavior? And if we can, if we can teach our kids how to build their executive function capacity, we can allow them to dramatically improve their peak performance. Um, the, the interesting thing, though, is that whenever I talk about executive function with, with teachers, I always get somebody who says, oh, that kid has no executive function, right? That kid, what she's saying is that kid really has a hard time managing his attention, right? But every single kid is born with executive function. And in fact, everybody, every brain is born with the same machinery for executive function, but how that executive function machinery develops is really contingent, really, really dependent on how that brain finds itself in the world. So if that brain finds itself in under conditions of extreme poverty or adversity or other sorts of you know residential mobility, things that really cluster around socioeconomic status, that tends to actually provide different numbers of opportunities to build executive function capacity. And that's a that's an equity issue, right? And we know that executive function can actually be trained. We know that because of the negative side, that if you don't give as much training to kids, um, their executive function capacity doesn't grow as much um, as kids that are given more opportunities to build their executive function. You can think of it as a muscle. Um, and so we actually have this responsibility, I think, as educational neuroscientists and as educators and as people who create products and programs for our kids to really make sure that we're providing as many opportunities for our kids to build executive function as possible. And if executive function might actually, if these gaps in, in opportunity um, give rise to gaps in executive function capacity, might that actually be the thing that is giving rise to our achievement gaps in, in, um, in education here? And, and could we, as has been said, could we actually train executive function to help close those opportunity gaps? And isn't that our responsibility? And that's the thing that is really, really exciting. So some of the, some of the programs that we design in our lab and our center um, are really geared towards that. Um, but we do it in a, in a really, um, I think, very interesting way. And it's really around this closed loop system of we have to, we have to know where a, a brain is, we have to understand where um, the executive function capacity is of that brain, and then, and then train it in a, in a personalized way, in a closed loop way where you're measuring and training, responding to that measurement, and then feeding that back into, into the adaptivity cycle. And so if we can do that closed loop training on individual learning capacities, that would be a tremendous way to actually close opportunity gaps that we are seeing dominating our education system. So that's where I feel like if we are thinking about peak performance, we need to think about it at a population level. And we need to think about it as a way to really promote equity in, in our educational system. Great. Please. Yeah, sure. Sure. So to be honest, um, I think the peak brain performance is a vague idea to me. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask Melina actually, so <laughs> do we actually can measure the performance? You mentioned the closed loop, like mm -hmm. getting the feedback into the learning process, mm -hmm. such that the learners can 
can get the feedback, so all the teachers can get the feedback, improve the learning or the teaching. Right. But uh, I'm not quite sure. So when we are mentioning about performance, I think one very key ingredient in that is whether we can measure the performance. And also there's another question is that whether we can measure this kind of performance uh, frequently, mm -hmm. not like in, a, in a, uh, or, or accessibly to, yeah. to, to make the measurement uh, uh, more accurate and accessible. That I think is very important when we are thinking about the closed loop that you mentioned. Right. Yeah, it's a wonderful question and I think exactly the right one. The, um, we know based on uh, very rich data that we can, uh, we can train executive function. Um, we can train those core capacities for, for learning. We know that on both the positive side and the negative side. So on the negative side, things like poverty and adversity and um, chronic stress, chronic sleep loss, those sorts of things can actually reduce a kid's ability to develop executive function. Mm -hmm. On the positive side, things like high quality caregiving, mm -hmm. a stable environment, autonomy supportive parenting, um, you know, high quality education. Uh, there are actually really cool studies that show that formal education, so if you take kids that are the exact same age, but fall on like one week or the other of school cutoff um, to go into first grade, and you scan their brains before they go into first grade or before they go into kindergarten um, and see how their executive function systems develop over the course of their year. They're the exact same age, but one has gone through, one group has gone through first grade, which has more formal rituals and, and rules. Um, and the kids that stay in kindergarten, you see that the kids that go through formal education, their executive function systems in their brain develop a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And they actually look a lot older and more mature because they've gone through formal education. So all of these things give us indicators that we can actually formally um, train or build executive function or slow the development of it. And so that, I think, then lends itself to us uh, thinking about systems and programs that we can institute in our schools and our homes that really leverage that idea that we do actually need to provide support for our kids to build their core capacities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so peak performance is fun to talk about, but let's, uh, let's take it to the other end of the spectrum. Um, there's a rising tide of mental illness in this country. Uh, we see it in the papers all the time. We deal with it in the classrooms continuously. Um, what gives you hope looking forward um, as you look at sort of advances in neuroscience, new technologies emerging, new approaches emerging that might be able to stem this tide and sort of bring it back uh, to a place of relative equilibrium in our, in our society. Um, Glenn, do you, do you want to kick this one off? Yeah, as, as I said earlier, right, we, as, a, as a school, we're seeing levels of anxiety, stress, uh, and toxic stress um, in ways we've never seen it before. And I remember when I, I started teaching, my first class was in 1991. Um, and my mindset as a teacher going into that class was, you know, students would leave their identity, their stress, their fear, um, their race class at the door. I taught history, they learned it, that was it, that was education. Um, but now I still teach history, and I actually know that until I can validate everybody's identity and acknowledge them as individuals um, and reduce that threat, I can be the greatest history teacher in the world, nothing's going to get in. So I, I think as a school, and many schools, right, we've, we've looked at mindfulness training, right, we've, we've looked at doing yoga, and I, I do want to say there's two brains at every school. Let's not forget there's an adult brain there as well, right, and, um, and I think we've thought about that very consciously, but we want our teachers to think about social and emotional learning as not reducing the rigor of the school, it actually allows you to get the best out of kids. Um, and that's sort of been our approach in, in the work we've done with teachers around the world. We want that balance that the kids need to be in, in the right emotional state. And here's again where I think things like uh, the Mindset Scholars Network, I don't know if you know their work, they're, I think they're out of LA or USC. Um, Stanford. That has been a, or Stanford, keep, just keep saying all the <laughs> stories. Uh, um, I didn't go to any of those schools, just for the record. Um, but the Mindset Scholars Network has been a game changer for our faculty in which they validated the belonging mindset above what I would argue growth mindset, even though growth mindset's more popular in, uh, amongst teachers. Um, so that's one way we've gone about addressing anxiety. Could we double click there? Can you describe it a little bit more? The belonging mindset? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I'm sure Malin could as well. You know, again, I think it's um, the idea that when a student enters a school building, I don't care what the zip code is or the geographic location, they must feel that they're welcome, their identity is validated, and that they are going to be pushed like every other kid to succeed at their, whether it's peak potential or at the highest level possible. And I would argue you can't have a growth mindset until you feel you belong. Yep. And that's why I think some work like the Mindset Scholars Network, please let them know I said this, um, is really elevated our ability to think about the learner from both a social and emotional perspective as well as an academic rigor, academic challenge perspective. Thanks, cool. Glenn. Can Did I you, yeah, go ahead and double down on that? Yeah. Um, so, so love, obviously love their work. They're, um, they're doing really incredible work, as you said. Um, one of the things that, that we're finding is that um, one of the reasons that a sense of belonging is so important is because um, it actually, it taps into what, what they call a recurrent loop, right? So every, every one of us has a, a personal identity of who we are and how we show up in the world. Our kids have a personal identity of who they are and how they show up in, in school, right? And if you feel like you don't belong, you're gonna be looking for signals out there that you don't belong, right? Or you're gonna be interpreting signals that may be neutral um, as evidence that you don't belong. And if you, if you are interpreting signals like that, then actually the majority of your executive function is captured by looking for signals, by monitoring external threat behavior, by monitoring internal performance, and therefore your core capacity for learning is not available for learning because it's completely eaten up with looking for, for these signals. And so that's one of the reasons that a sense of belonging can really accelerate learning because it actually frees up your executive function for learning, which is really cool. But the other thing why these, these short interventions, these belonging interventions or other mindset interventions are so effective is because they do tap into this recurrent loop of who you are and how you show up in the world. And every time you go into a new environment, that recurrent loop opens up and is very, is very vulnerable, but also is a very powerful, um, a powerful opportunity, right? A window of opportunity because you can then, you can open up that sense of who you are and, and give that sense of who you are as a, as a learner, as somebody who belongs, as somebody who is, um, who has been able to master things that other people didn't think that they were able to master. So it's this really beautiful opportunity to do something that continually reinforces internally all the time. It's Luis, really you're exciting. nodding your head vigorously. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes, Plus absolutely. One. <laughs> um, I, um, I do a lot of pro bono work for an organization called Yes for School, uh, teaching uh, reading techniques in underprivileged schools in Newark and other places in New York and the, the, the result of this, like all the students breathing in the morning has transformed the landscape of the schools That's radically. Great. And the first thing they do in the morning is they go towards each other and they say, I belong to you. And I, every time my heart melts, it's a beautiful uh, thing that really speaks to what you're saying. Back to the problem of mental disorder. Um, before I got involved in this company, only a couple of years ago, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm more of a business guy. I was at Amazon before and I left everything to do this because of the statistics that I'm gonna give you. 20% uh, of the US population has a mental disorder. Uh, and of that, 50% don't know it. And therefore, go in life untreated. And so the cost of this personal economic for society, for employers is absolutely tremendous. Uh, and there's got to be a lot done to address this. And in my personal opinion, screening is, a, is the number one issue to have a short-term impact. Uh, and the issue with screening, obviously, is stigmatization. So uh, if you send me a questionnaire as an employee of uh, any company saying self-select, are you an alcoholic, are you an addict or depressed, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and so that's one problem. The other issue is that uh, we were raised, and I was one of those kids who was raised uh, toughing it up. And so I believe that my misery is normal. And we, we all think that way to a certain degree. So the need and the, the impulse to go screen ourselves for mental health is very low. 
So any technology or communication solution that addresses that 50% of the population, to me, is a low-hanging fruit. It's not complex, it's not difficult, it's a communication issue whereby with technology, and I, I hope I'm one of those technology companies, but there are others, uh, if you are going to approach mental health for what it is, not mental illness, but mental health, where you have capacities that are working well or not, you're, you're at peak or you're not, uh, if you take that end and use a screening as a secondary goal, you end up screening a lot of people who come in. So. Uh, companies like Boeing were able to uh, assess 75% of the employee population. Uh, this is extraordinary. Uh, we're able to tell them, here's your risk, or so many people are at risk of this or at risk of that, and we are sending them to the right resource when we see it. It's 100% confidential and anonymous, uh, but that sort of thing gives me hope, and, and I hope there's going to be more of it. And Hui, what, what about what's going on in China with regards well, to mental illness? And you're a technologist, yeah, can you so, fix it? Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have actually a lot of experience helping people with mental illness, mm -hmm. but uh, I do have a story maybe I can share um, that uh, in the past few years, we, we, we've seen a lot of users uh, of our software, our app, that uh, actually uh, they, they, they changed. So, so one, one, one story that I would like to share is that there's one of our users, uh, he's, uh, uh, he, he was a 10-year-old kid when he started to using our app. Well, by the way, our app, one of our apps helps uh, people to learn a new language, like English. So this kid, uh, he had a problem of speaking up in his native language, which is Mandarin. But after he played with our app, which teaches him to learn English, and our app is actually you know, not human, but machine, so he had no problem. He, he had no problem interact with the app. With interacting the app, uh, and he, he practiced English, and he, can, he, he started to learn how to speak in English. And more importantly, or more excitingly, that we found that he started to gaining confidence uh, in communication. He started to speak Chinese, speak Mandarin to other people. So we see tremendous change of this person that uh, starting from a, a very shy uh, uh, individual that could not communicate with person to be a person that can with confidence and communicate with not only his native language, but also the second language, English, that he learned. So um, in the past few years, we see lots of users that may not have mental illness, but by learning a new skill, mm -hmm. in particular learning a new language, actually opens windows for them. Some actually, the lives of them change tremendously by learning a new stuff. So that actually, inspires to mission our company to you know, empower everyone to achieve their full potential mm -hmm. by leveraging a lot of science, learning science, and leveraging the technology to make this kind of effective learning universal accessible to, to such that this technology can reach to many more people. The last bit I want to share is that um, inspired by this story, we actually are uh, making our uh, software, our app, available to a lot of rural areas in China. So in China, there are a lot of rural areas that not enough teacher to teach the kids to learn a language. So we, 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 we make our app available. We, we, we actually donate smartphones to the, universe, to, to the schools such that the kids can study with our app. And by learning new stuff, learning a new language, uh, we hope we will give them a better chance in their future. Terrific. Okay. So, so we've got a broad spectrum of individuals in this room, um, and when they leave today, it would probably be helpful for them to have one of their neuro myths destroyed. So <laughs> talk to us um, about you know, what are the biggest misconceptions that you see out there in sort of the general public as it relates to neuroscience writ large? 
how much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. Um, let's see, one of the biggest ones is, well, can I do three? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Quickly. Okay, three. Um, first is learning styles. So despite this being a, a billion dollar industry for education, um, there's no evidence in support of learning styles. We, um, it turns out if you need to, if you wanna learn how to ride a horse and you think you're an auditory learner, you're probably gonna learn better by actually doing it rather than hearing it. Um, so that's the first one. Um, the second is around left brain, right brain. Um, so, you know, we have this idea that we are either, you know, logical, linear, sequential left brain thinkers or, uh, you know, really creative, abstract right brain thinkers. And it turns out we use 100% of our brain 100% of the time. Um, we might have a preference for, um, and we might have an aptitude for abstract thinking, you know, creative thinking or um, logical, linear, sequential thinking, but it doesn't mean that you're only using your left brain or you're only using your right brain. Um, and in fact, both of those two neuromyths are really destructive because what it tells us as a learner is if I am a, if I think I'm an auditory learner, I'm gonna shut down to all other learning opportunities that are not being given to me through my ears. Exactly, and likewise for left brain, right brain, if I think I'm only a linear sequential thinker, I'm gonna shut down opportunities to build my creativity. And those are destructive ideas. Those are destructive mindsets for a, a developing learner to think about. And the last one is the 10% myth, that we use only 10% of our brains. Um, we use 100% of our brains 100% of the time. Uh, the way, but it's such a beautiful neuromyth because it, it really reveals how, um, how kind of optimistic we are that like if we could just use that other tap into that other 90% we would be Lucy and it's ridiculous but sorry um, but we do have so much untapped potential but it's not because we're not using our brains it's because of the ways in which we're using our brains so that's what's so beautiful about this movement about thinking about how might we actually build peak performance in our kids um, instead of just saying work harder, use more of your brain, it actually is a more nuanced way to empower the learners to take charge and be, be agents of their own learning, which is so, so, so exciting to me. Fabulous, three, yes. Uh, well, I'll go with one quickly. I remember when I first started teaching, I, somebody told me the brain is fixed by before they graduate high school, right? <laughs> um, and I will just say, I'm always asked when we present to teachers and school leaders around the world, What's the most important uh, educational neuroscience concept? And no teacher should be in front of students and no school leader should be leading a school if they don't believe in the concept of neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. And not only that, not, yeah. it's not only for the youngest learner, but it's also for the oldest learners, right? Um, and let my wife who works for ARP would be happy I just said that. <laughs> um, but I really want, you should not be able to be in front of students unless you believe every student can get better. It might not happen in the year you have him or her, or, her, or however they identify, um, but you gotta have that belief. So the idea that the brain is fixed by your teenage years, let's kill that myth, at least in this room, and let's spread the gospel. High five. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Luis. Um, for me, the biggest uh, one is about uh, how we uh, associate the brain with cognition a lot more than we do with emotions. Most people, including me, uh, up until I was in my late 40s, I thought, I think here and I feel here, right? Uh, you, you have emotions in your heart, not your brain. Uh, and so uh, our brains generate emotions every one-fifth of a second. Treats and emotion comes up every one-fifth of a second. And, uh, and that has a huge influence on our capacity to think and our capacity to self-regulate. And uh, the issue with emotions is unlike every other capacity, it's unconscious. So how do you deal with this unconscious part to become a better you is really the thing, the, the $1,000 question in this day and age where we now have data to come and test ourselves and AB split test ourselves and try stuff and see if we feel better and, and, and improve our non-conscious brain is now possible. Beautiful, awake. Yeah. I'm not sure whether this is uh, uh, one of the misunderstandings of the general public of our brain, but uh, I was surprised when I first learned it. So it is about the so-called uh, default mode network of the brain. Mm -hmm. So consider two scenarios. One scenario is that uh, 
a human is doing a specific task, like playing a Go game or doing a panorama talk. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> and the other scenario is that you are just resting and relax. Um, in which scenario does the brain consume more energy? In which scenario uh, does the brain, uh, is the brain more active? So I think I, I thought, uh, obviously, probably doing the specific task, the brain is more active, the, the brain consumes more energy, but the fact is that neuroscientists discovered that even in the resting or relaxing state of human, the brain actually doing quite actively in not only on the frontal cortex, but also in the posterior singular cortex, there are significant activities, uh, in, even in some areas, more active when you are doing a particular task. So that's a very, I think it's a very uh, counterintuitive and very interest, interesting findings. Actually, the so-called default network uh, uh, exists probably might be related to uh, our sense of, our conscious of ourself, like there is another name of this network called a me network, a self network. It may relate it to what we think uh, of a person, uh, the ego itself. So it's quite interesting. Uh, actually, there are, I think there are some recent studies shows that the meditation actually deactivate, deactivate the default network in the brain such that the person can feel connected to uh, a lot of things, so the, so the sense of self diminishes and, and the sense of connectivity increase. So I think that's quite interesting when I first found it. Yeah, fantastic. So um, I've learned a lot from this panel. I've got one last question for you all. One word answers, please. <laughs> um, we're midway through 2019 here. Technology is moving fast. I want to hear from each one of you what year you think thought-based computing might actually happen. And what I mean by that is you think, and it happens on the screen in a complex way. Luis. I would never be able to answer this, but my <laughs> neuroscientist uh, at, uh, at work told me to. That was 75 words. Yes. One, <laughs> one year. 2030. Gotcha. I, I have no clue. Uh, hopefully, uh, 2025. It's already happening. Right on. No, it is. <laughs> Um, I have no idea. <laughs> it's hard. All right, there it's you hard, go. A it's bunch of great, great smart future. neuroscience oriented people <laughs> can't tell you the truth about the future of thought based computing. Thank you all for coming. Let's thank the panel. Thank you.